Welcome to the 2017 Distance Learning and Telemedicine Grant Program webinar provided to you from the Loan Origination and Approval Division of Rural Utilities Service. Rural Utilities Service is an agency under rural development, which is an agency under the Department of Agriculture. This webinar will provide an overview of program requirements to assist with an applica application under this program. We thank you for your interest in utilizing federal programs to assist rural communities. Please understand any information which may be presented during this webinar which contradicts program regulation does not change regulated requirements. All regulations supersedes this, any information provided. The mission of the Distance Learning and Telemedicine Grant Program is to provide or improve distance learning and or telemedicine services in rural America. This program is primarily for the funding of equipment, which will be placed in rural areas in order to help bridge the divide between the urban services most likely seen in more populated areas to bring those services to the less dense areas of rural America. The purpose or mission of this program is to try to overcome the effects of remoteness and low population density. The next couple of slides will discuss the definitions for distance learning and telemedicine. All applications submitted must demonstrate that their project is a synchronous delivery of curriculum via a telecommunications or most or more readily known as a broadband connection. We normally see two types of projects under distance learning. One could be educational programs, instruction or information that may originate in one area which may be urban to a more rural area, or it could be information or programs originating from a rural site to another rural site. Also, we see applications which look at connecting teachers and students. This may be an example if a specialty such as physics or advanced mathematics uh, instructors at one location may be needed at other locations that do not have that type of curriculum and this shared resource could provide the ability for schools to provide additional instruction without incurring the cost of the staff. When evaluating distance learning projects, RUS will look at this definition and purpose. All applications need to be reminded that your project needs to demonstrate that it is a synchronous delivery. And this means that it's real time. We're not, RUS does not look at projects that record information to be accessed over the internet as an eligible purpose. Also, the equipment presented within the distance learning application or telemedicine application needs to be consistent and be fully discussed under the telecommunication system plan, which will be discussed in a later slides. As discussed in the previous slide regarding distance learning, the telemedicine definition is similar regarding a synchronous telecommunication or a broadband link. Most common telemedicine type programs are seen where a medical professional who is located within a more urban area is connected synchronously to rural clinics or end-user sites providing that service where, it's, where, it, where it is needed and not available. The definition of telemedicine projects, applications need to make sure that their projects meet the requirements of the broadband telecommunication connection. It must be synchronous. Please understand, recorded or information collection, which can be viewed over a standard internet connection or at a later time, is not considered a synchronous connection. Projects cannot propose links within a same building. So on this slide, we want to discuss the funding available for the fiscal year 2017 and recap the fiscal year 2016 application period. Last year, RUS was, award, was budgeted $23.4 million for this program. We did receive 182 applications. 98 applications were awarded. Of that amount, totaled $27.9 million in grant funds. 
56 of those 98 included distance learning and 42 represented telemedicine projects. Each application must meet the requirements set forth within the regulation and of this is a matching requirement. A minimum 15% match is required and a minimum grant amount requested is 50000 The maximum grant amount is 500000 An example would be for a minimum grant amount a project could be presented that totaled $57,500. 50000 of that would be grant and then 15% of 50000 is 7500 which would be the match, which would make a total project cost of 57500 Please understand, the percent of matching is based on the grant amount or the federal dollars requested. Do not use this calculation against your project total. We do not accept any loan, loans or combo loan grant applications. This funding period is only for grants, and the website for the distance learning telemedicine program is at the bottom right side of the slide and will also be discussed later. This slide, we want to highlight the availability of communication upgrades for ambulances and, tele and medical transport equipment. Although this has not been an ineligible purpose in previous applications, RUS is seeing more interest in this category. And we want to make sure that applicants fully understand the requirements and what will be allowed under the category uh, for ambulances and medical transport equipment. What is meant by communication upgrades? What RUS is looking at is the synchronous, again, going back to the original definition, a synchronous connection regarding equipment placed within an ambulance or a medical transport and the equipment at a medical facility, which may be a clinic or a hospital. Now also understand when we get to the rurality discussion regarding sites, this type of application or this type of project would be considered a non-fixed project because the ambulance uh, could go to multiple locations that do, do not have a designated site. And with that being said, a non-fixed application or a non-fixed project will be scored based on the hub location that the ambulance will be traveling to. Again, I would like to restate the equipment for this purpose will be the equipment that is provided within the ambulance or medical transport equipment and the equipment that may be located at the medical facility. So this slide represents the eligible applicants under this program. As you can see here, you must be either incorporated or a partnership, uh, Indian tribe, tribal organization, state or local unit of government, a consortium, which we will discuss in the next slides, or other legal entity. It could be nonprofit or for profit. One thing to note RUS does not consider a person or individual as an eligible applicant under this program. As discussed in the previous slide, a consortium is considered an eligible entity. We want to discuss two types of consortium commonly seen with applications. Also note that this is discussed on page four of the application guide. So there are two types of consortiums that we do want to discuss. First is what we consider a legal uh, consortium that's organized within the state. This means that a group of individual entities have come together and they have formed um, a separate entity which represents all the groups and legally organize that entity under the state. The other example is what we consider an informal consortium. Now with an informal consortium, RUS does require that one of the individuals or organizations in the consortium contract with RUS as what we consider the lead entity and this lead entity will be responsible for oversight of the project, will be responsible for the funds, uh, will be responsible for the equipment uh, throughout the project's life and after. 
So please be mindful of that if you are an informal consortium and all the organizations want control of the equipment, then all entities under that informal consortium must contract with RUS. If there's, you know, we will entertain questions on this. This does tend sometimes to be a confusing topic, but if you do have questions, please uh, contact us and we will clarify what we mean by contracting with RUS and the requirements. So at this time we want to discuss the categories of eligible grant purposes. There are three main categories. First is acquiring by lease or purchase eligible equipment. If equipment is leased, RUS will only fund under the grant portion the three-year life of the grant. Acquiring instructional programming it must be a capital asset, normally a first-time purchase, and it can include the purchase or lease of instructional programming already on the market. Providing technical assistance and instruction for using eligible equipment. This category includes any type of engineering, assistance for training of the use of the equipment, installation, and other items that are considered technical assistance. This portion of your grant budget cannot exceed 10% of the grant amount or 10% of the eligible matching funds calculated separately. So at this time, we want to discuss the use of eligible equipment within your application. This is a list provided here of the most commonly seen equipment in past applications. This list is not all-inclusive. And also, to be eligible equipment, you must meet the 50% or more use definition or rule. RUS will evaluate all equipment provided within your application against the use of 50% or more. And if you as the applicant do not demonstrate that the equipment presented, it will be used for distance learning or telemedicine purpose 50% or more of the time, RUS may remove that equipment. Also, remember the definition of synchronous connection. RUS will evaluate each piece of equipment that you present within your budget to see if it meets the rule of synchronous connection. If it does not, RUS may again remove that equipment. How do you demonstrate the use of the equipment? This will be under tab G, discussed later, called the telecommunication system plan. Also, it will be represented within tab D, scope of work. You must fully demonstrate that the equipment you're requesting to be funded under the grant will meet these requirements to be uh, applicable. Also, all equipment must be new or non-depreciated. Normally, RUS does not allow equipment purchased prior to submission of the application to be considered part of the project, except for one rule. If you have equipment that you are looking at providing for in-kind match or as part of the cash match that was previously purchased and has never been installed, that equipment may be allowed by RUS within the project. Again, if you need clarification on eligible equipment or the equipment that you're looking at may be questionable, you can always send your question to RUS and we'll discuss later in this webinar how to contact us either by email or telephone. So let's discuss ineligible equipment. Ineligible equipment would be anything not meaning of course the definition of the eligible equipment but also we do not fund under this program the installation construction or acquiring of telecommunication transmission facilities. What we mean by this is if you're end user site or any site that equipment will be placed within needs a broadband connection from an outside provider, RUS will not allow funding for that connection from the provider to your facility. Past that point would be considered eligible. Also we do not pay for medical equipment, not having a telemedicine as an essential function. Also we list here the 50% rule. 
Again, you must demonstrate within your telecommunication system plan how the, the equipment proposed will meet the eligible requirements. Please note, RUS do, do not, does not fund salaries or administrative expenses. Also, RUS will only allow labor from third-party sources. So you can have installation as an eligible expense under your application as long as it comes from an outside source. This has been a confusing items for you know current applications where they have internal IT personnel that will be installing the equipment and they want reimbursement for that. RUS cannot reimburse IT personnel for that are internal for installation because that's considered salary. It must be a third party. The purchase of land buildings or alterations. Uh, this also is a topic that many people have questions on. Uh, for instance, lighting to make your, uh, a distance learning room or possibly a telemedicine room or where the equipment will be um, placed may need upgrade, but it is considered a building alteration and therefore will not be allowed under this program. Another uh, piece of equipment that is ineligible, I want to talk about at this time, is furniture and furnishings for your room. RUS does not consider desks, chairs, or anything uh, of that nature to be considered eligible equipment. Although, if the uh, equipment, or let's say the furnishing within the room, is installed as part of the with the equipment such as podiums that can be considered as eligible. This again is not all inclusive what we're uh, discussing here and each applicant you know you need to base your application off the definitions and if you have any questions please contact RUS. Please note this is discussed in the application guide on page 6. So at this time, let's discuss some eligibility requirements. A couple of items here is the minimum reality score. This is based off your scoring for these sites listed as hub end users or end user sites. And it is based off uh, population, which will be discussed in later slides. But under this score, if your application does not gain a minimum of 20 points, you will not be eligible or your project will not be eligible for funding under this program. The matching contribution, as discussed before, is a minimum of 15%. If your application does not demonstrate this minimum requirement of 15% match, of which the matching contribution also must be eligible purposes that would fall under the grant, your application cannot be accepted for a review and will be denied. There are special matching provisions as listed below for certain areas. You should see page 17 of the guide. And these special provisions do not apply for the leveraging or matching score. So let's discuss a little further matching funds. This is under the leveraging worksheet. Matching funds can either be cash or equipment. If it's equipment, it's considered in-kind contributions. And it must be for purposes that otherwise are eligible for grant funding. Therefore, you cannot use such things as salaries, administrative expenses, or other items that were listed on the ineligible eligible, um, slide discussed earlier as purposes of match. The value of in-kind contributions must be supported. I do want to take a little bit more time on this set section here regarding in-kind. Vendor discounts in the past have been presented as an in-kind match. Those are not eligible in-kind contributions. Discounts are not a full value of the equipment and cannot sometimes be fully supported. Therefore, RUS requires if in-kind contributions from, from vendors are represented within the application, it must be for the full value of the equipment donated and not discounted. Also, remember we discussed about new equipment. Matching funds or in-kind equipment 
must also represent new equipment and non-depreciated. Therefore, don't get caught up if a vendor offers a piece of equipment that may be refurbished as an in-kind match because a refurbished piece of, piece of equipment is not considered new and will not be allowed as match. Keep in mind that matching funds cannot come from other federal sources. So if you are receiving possibly funds from a state um, organization or another organization that may, may receive federal funds for use in economic development, you need to make sure that those are not considered federal funds anymore before you try to use them for a match. You must support all your cash and in-kind matches. This can be uh, completed through support letters. We'll discuss this a little bit more under section C-3, uh, which we'll discuss leveraging, and we'll discuss the leveraging worksheet, which represents how your match will be provided. Again, the 15% minimum requirement of matching funds is based on your grant request. For example, Let's say that an applicant applied for this project was requesting $100,000 in grant funds. They proposed match cash of $100,000, which would be a 100% match. The project total would be $200,000. So for a 100% match means that dollar per dollar you as the applicant will be providing money received from the federal government on the basis of that ratio. So we are going to start discussing the scoring criteria for your application. The DLT grant application is a competitive application and therefore awards are based on the highest ranked applications based on scores received and verified within the application. There are two categories of scoring. One is the objective criteria. The second is the subjective criteria. The objective criteria is the criteria represent, presented by you as the applicant within the worksheets provided for the application. Rurality, it uses the rurality worksheet and is based on end user site locations. And the scoring is based on population size for that population center. You should have the same sites listed on the reality worksheet as you list on your site worksheet under tab A. You may represent a hub site, which is only a site defined as providing services from that site to sites either in more rural areas or suburban areas, or what we call the end user sites. A true hub site should also we prefer to be listed on the reality sheet but is not scored for the purposes of this grant also keep in mind the reason RUS asks for you to provide the information for the hub site is if at any time during the review of your application it is apparent that the hub site you represent is receiving services from other sites within the application it will no longer be considered a true hub and will be changed to a hub end user and RUS will calculate that site score and adjust your score accordingly. You should list the data that's provided for the reality score. The application guide does cover this, uh, in my opinion, very well. Provides examples for you to, to go from. And at any time, if you have questions, please contact RUS. The next sheet or scoring category is the Economic Need NSLP Worksheet. So the Economic Need or NSLP Worksheet scoring criteria is based on free and reduced lunches provided from statistics from the National School Lunch Program. This scoring criteria you can get up to a maximum of 35 points. The information provided uh, or the supporting information required under this section must be 
the uh, NSLP information used to calculate your score, please highlight which site information from the NSLP sheet is used for calculation. This information must also be verifiable by RUS. So there is one or two ways for us to verify. You as the applicant need to provide if you gain the NSLP information from a website, you need to provide that website address for RUS to confirm the information. If it is not validated by a website and you had to independently find this information from school districts, you need to provide letters from the school districts and they need to certify or confirm that the information provided is accurate for the scoring of your application. So next we're going to discuss matching funds. As discussed previously, matching funds are eligible uh, must be for eligible purposes as well and can be either cash or in kind. There is a minimum requirement of 15 percent based on the grant amount requested. The leveraging worksheet is provided for, the, uh, for you to use in the application. On this worksheet you will list the donors for either in kind uh, match or cash match and the leveraging worksheet must be supported by letters from the donors. Please make sure that if uh, the letters provided are signed uh, by an authorized representative of the organization. If this is your organization, it must be someone who has the authority to allocate these funds. If you are using cash match, please make sure that your supporting letters uh, pr provided also state the dollar amount provided for match. RUS needs to verify that the matching funds are uh, correct and they are available uh, to be used for your project. So we're going to quickly review the worksheets regarding reality, economic need, and match. Under reality, you have a maximum score of 45. Under economic need, you have a maximum score of 35, and you have a maximum score of 35 under matching funds. So you as the applicant, once you submit your application, should know if everything is correct, your score based on this 100, these 115 points. The total scoring of the base application is 220 points. So over 50% of the scoring you should know once you submit your application. So the reality worksheet, as you notice here, it has a site number, a site name, and then you do the site designation. You as the applicant must provide the designation to us. RUS will evaluate based on your application if you have correctly categorized your site. A hub, as discussed earlier, will not be scored under reality or economic need. This worksheet, as you can see, you must provide the census population. For scoring or calculating of your score, you will take that population for each line item that is a hub end user or an end user, evaluate it against the, uh, the matrix you see below. If you're 5,000 or fewer, then that, that would give you 45 points for that site. Each site will then be calculated based on these scores. Once you list all your sites, you have allocated the points for each reality score. You will take the average of that score and place it at the bottom of the worksheet, which will be your overall reality score. Next, we're going to discuss economic need worksheet. Notice you still have the site number, site name, and site designation. These categories should replicate the same line numbers that you had on the reality worksheet. But the economic need worksheet lists the school district, total students, and percent eligibility. As discussed before, this is because we score this sheet using the free and reduced lunch percentage at that site. 
Now you as the applicant need to determine if you have to use a district score or an individual school location score. The easy way to look at this is where the equipment will be um, installed. If you are a telemedicine project and you're installing the equipment at a clinic that covers a wide area, then you're not at a specific school location. So you will need to use the school district information for your scoring on this worksheet. If you are a distance learning project and you're going to be placing equipment within an individual school, then you can use that school's information for your scoring. A college that's placing equipment within a college facility would fall in the same category as like a med medical facility where you cover, uh, cover a wide area and would have to use the school district sheet, the scoring. Now, could telemedicine ever use an individual school? Certainly. In a situation where you may be implementing equipment within a school for a healthcare uh, purpose, then you would use that school location. Again, just like the reality sheet, you would take each line item. Once you've placed the percentage score, score based on the points below, you will have, actually, excuse me, you will take the percentage of each individual line item. You will then average that percentage. The final percentage average that you have, you will use the matrix scoring table at the bottom. If you if your percentage is 75% or greater, then your score for this worksheet would be 35 points. You are you can round to the the hundredth or the second decimal place, but please do not round up to the first to the next whole number. So let's discuss the leveraging worksheet at this time. The leveraging worksheet is a pretty simple uh, worksheet. This is where you will list each donor that's providing either a cash or in-kind uh, match. If you have a single donor that may be providing both uh, match dollars, it may be beneficial to separate that donor out on each line. Uh, just be sure that when you're looking at the support documentation for this tab, you will have the appropriate support uh, for each line item. Uh, once you calculate this through, you will come up with a percentage based on the grant amount of the project. You're requesting federal funds. And then, uh, for instance, let's say you're looking at between 75 and 100% match. You would uh, score 30 points. You would put that 30 at the bottom of the worksheet. And that will be your score for leveraging. Now, on support documentation, it is very important that you provide a support letter of documentation for each line that you propose on the leveraging worksheet. It needs to be representative of each company. So if, uh, for example, if company XYZ was donating $50,000 to your project in a cash match, that letter from XYZ, preferably on letterhead, needs to be signed by an authorized personnel or person who has the uh, ability to provide that budget dollar and the letter needs to state fifty thousand uh, dollars we don't want letters that are vague or letters that just propose uh, for instance by making the statement if budget allows we will provide x dollars if letters like that are in your uh, are filed for support under leveraging worksheet RUS uh, may not give you the credit for that uh, percent that dollar amount and may remove that dollar amount therefore possibly reducing your leveraging uh, score. Other things to keep in mind if you do not provide the documentation appropriate and you drop below 15 percent of uh, match you will be ineligible and RUS will have to uh, return your application. Uh, other items to look at is when er the cross-reference and make sure that the dollar amount on your leveraging worksheet is the same on your budget worksheet uh, to keep that consistent because if we see different amounts then 
whatever is verifiable on the leveraging worksheet, RUS may adjust your budget worksheet by that amount. So at this time, we're going, we will discuss the subjective criteria scoring, which is the section that RUS will be evaluating uh, based on documentation provided within your applica application. There's four categories of the subjective criteria scoring. Additional NSLP, need for services and project benefits, innovativeness, cost effectiveness, and then there's a special category called special considerations we will discuss. First, we want to look at additional NSLP. As you remember on previous slides, the economic worksheet was based on the free and reduced lunch percentage of either a school district or a school location. If you as the applicant did not receive greater than 50% of the free and reduced lunch on this worksheet, you can apply for up to 10 points of additional NSLP. You must provide documentation within this uh, section. You will provide the additional NSLP worksheet requesting the 10 points. The documentation must represent how you uh, show that the there is a greater economic need than is showed through the NSLP available to you. Some examples of this could be recent closures in businesses or factories that uh, based on the previous release of NSLP information was not caught within the free and reduced lunch calculation. Or it could be a demographic issue that there's a greater economic need than the NSLP would capture. Secondly, we want to discuss need for services and project benefits. This is the highest scoring category in subjective scoring with up to 45 points available. I highly recommend you as the applicant to review pages 19, 19 through 21 of the application guide involving the needs and benefits. RUS is looking for your discussion on how uh, your project will help the community on an economic standpoint, a healthcare standpoint, and an edu educational standpoint. You need to clearly define the need for your project as well as clearly demonstrating how the project will meet that need through the benefit of the federal dollars being invested. You need to show support for your project. This is where you will include letters from community leaders, from organizations participating with your project. For example, if you're a consortium type application where there are multiple, let's just use distance learning for example. Say you have multiple schools participating in your application. Each end user site or school location should provide documentation that they are participating in the project, they support the project, and that there is that need for what the project will fulfill. Don't overlook professional letters. This is a good way as you as an applicant to demonstrate that the need does exist and have a professional opine on how the project being implemented will bring about the benefit as you described. Toward the end of this section, you as the applicant need to discuss the non-duplication part of your application. And what I mean by that is RUS will not fund applicants or applications that duplicate equipment or purposes previously funded. For example, if previously uh, a applicant applied for funding at certain locations and then you're submitting that application uh, an application again for the same locations for the same equipment for the same purposes RUS will deem that as duplication and cannot fund your project but replacement of equipment is not considered duplication so you may have received a previous award years ago where the equipment needs to be upgraded due to high definition or links to resource sites uh, are not compatible and applying for that uh, upgrade of the equipment is not considered duplication. Again, 
you need to document 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 I cannot stress enough how you need to support this section and don't just provide vague overviewing comments on how your project um, will meet the the need of the community show community involvement it's very important uh, we want to see that your community is involved with your project and that you, the community supports the project uh, as you represent it to be implemented so now let's discuss innovativeness it may seem to be hard uh, to demonstrate how your project's innovative because the distance learning telemedicine or the equipment used throughout these projects have been around for many years. But your innovativeness in your project may come from other places, not necessarily about the equipment you're using, but it could be that this is a first time that you're using this equipment for a specific need or for a specific community. And there also could be creative ways that you're implementing this project. So fully describe how you feel you're being innovative with your project and you know, give RUS enough information here that we can understand your viewpoint uh, and your approach to this category. The next category is cost effectiveness. This evaluates the efficiency for which your project is proposed as it relates to technology and education. Page 23 provides five issues that should be addressed under this section. And this is under the application guide. Again, use these five areas as bullet points as you would in any of these other scoring categories and address each of those points individually. You need to provide supporting documentation such as charts or information to demonstrate how you evaluate your cost effectiveness. You need to fully document your reasoning and assumptions. Uh, it could be that you have other, you know, letters from other organizations that state that this is the most cost-effective approach for the implementation of the equipment. You need to show that RUS, that you did look at different types of equipment, maybe different vendors. You need to show that information within your documentation. Um, I commonly tell people to approach this as you would a business plan to your CEO. What would you present to someone that you're trying to demonstrate to them that, hey, my project is cost effective and should be funded? So the cost effectiveness, innovativeness, needs and benefits, and additional NSLP make up the remaining 105 points of a base application for a total of 220 points. The next category that we're going to discuss is what we call special consideration. There are 15 points here available to a specific applicant who demonstrates that they are within a trust area or tribal jurisdiction, strike force, or promise zone. And what we, we mean by this, as stated on this slide, it mu there must be at least one end user site within one of these areas. You don't have to have an end user site in all areas, just one of these areas. And you must support and show us within the application, either by, you know, with a map, information from uh, one of the websites we're going to discuss, discuss here later, and document so that we can verify uh, your choice of a special consideration. Again, it is only for end user sites or hub end user sites. We do not uh, recognize the hub site as a eligibility for scoring under the special consideration points. So let's discuss the special consideration a little more in the next few slides. So as stated here, you must have at least one end user site within one of these three areas to gain the extra 15 points. We ask that you document with a map showing the end user site or sites located within the area as well as a geographical coordinates, physical street address, or other method 
that RUS can use to, to verify the site does exist within this special consideration area. Please reference page 23 and 24 of the application guide if you're proposing sites within the area of a trust area or tribal jurisdiction. These are websites if your areas will, will be contained or your end user site is contained within a strike force or a promise zone that you should go to to evaluate. Also you can evaluate this, um, these sites to see if they may be located within your area that you're proposing your project. Again this is on page 23 and 24 of the application guide. So now we're going to discuss you know, completing the grant application with an overview of each tab and this is is represented on the application guide in the application guide on page 9 so as you see here your application needs to be have these tabs represented from A to L we will discuss each of these tab individually on this slide for a little bit better understanding of what you will be looking at when completing that respective tab before we get started, I do want to discuss one item, and that's regarding electronic applications. Many times RUS has had the hardship of trying to determine where one section starts and another section ends. So when using the electronic application process, please make sure that you put a tab cover sheet for each section that you upload to the system or you may decide to do individual uploads for each tab. This will allow RUS to understand when we're going from tab to tab what information should be represented, represented respective to that tab. So starting at tab A, which is the standard form 424 with attachments. So tab A contains the standard form 424 this is your application for assistance for federal program. This is a standard form and is used widely across rural development. We at RUS have provided within the application guide an attachment of this form with information that is um, reflects reflects or demonstrates uh, specific information related to the DLT program. The two attachments being discussed under this tab is the site worksheet, which as discussed before should be consistent with your reality worksheet and your economic need worksheet. The site worksheet should list, list all sites within your project. We do prefer you as the applicant to list a hub site on the site worksheet even if the hub site is not um, being provided equipment under the grant. You are required to list all sites of which equipment expenses will be provided to or equipment will be installed with on this site worksheet. The second attachment is what we call the optional survey. This is for nonprofits and we do uh, request that you complete this survey and provide it with your application. Keep in mind, the standard 424 form is a, the actual request for grant funds and support from the federal government. Therefore, it must be signed by an authorized representative of your organization that has the ability and power to contract with the federal government. The form also contains contact information. Please provide RUS correct contact information relevant to the application for, instance, for cases where RUS may have questions or need clarifications. Tab B, the executive summary. This starts on page 10 of the application guide. There are seven topics discussed within tab B for the executive summary. We encourage you as the applicant to use these topics to build your executive summary description and also uh, address these topics completely. This, the executive summary, could also be used for request of the state director. 
As you see on tab K, there's a consultation required of the USDA State Director. Information of your project must be provided for that consultation, and the, tab, the executive summary would be a great place to start. Tab C, scoring criteria and, uh, for the, the project. As discussed before with reality, economic need, and all the scoring criteria for subjective and, and objective scoring is all contained within tab C. This is the majority of uh, information that RUS will look at, but the information contained within this tab needs to be supported on the, on the other tabs, such as tab D and G regarding scope of work and telecommunication system plan. So let's talk about tab D. This is your scope of work. At minimum, this tab should contain four items. The, these items are listed in the application guide for this section, but I'm going to restate them uh, at this time for informational purposes. First, we want you to discuss specific activities to be performed under the project. Second, we want you to discuss who will carry out these activities. Third, we want to discuss we want you to discuss the time frames for accomplishing objectives and the activities outlined within your application. For instance, regarding time frames, RUS may, has the requirement that your project must be complete within three years. So your application for time frames of accomplishing these objectives needs to support that you will implement and have your project active within three years. And the last item, number four, is the budget. The budget will contain all equipment that you're requesting grant funding or and show the match contribution for. It will be a complete list of items that will be under that will represent your project's equipment installations and will be discussed later in the webinar. Tab E. This is the Financial Information and Sustainability tab. You need to provide a narrative description which must contain at least minimum three topics requested represented within the page seven, 27 excuse me, of the application guide. Tab F. This is the Statements of Experience. RES wants to understand that you as the applicant have the experience and knowledge to be able to complete this project as you've uh, presented it to us. The last thing RES wants to do is to award a, uh, an application or a project to an organization that does not have the ability to complete the project and essentially remove those funds from uh, another uh, project that would be able to use them. So within the tab F, we ask that you provide a written narrative. You can support the narrative by providing names, titles, and experience. Resumes are commonly seen within this section. Tab G, the telecommunication system plan. This is a very important tab that, you know, sometimes applicants tend to overlook. The telecommunication system plan must incorporate maps and diagrams, must be thorough discussions on how each piece of equipment represented within your budget meets the 50% use requirement, and I encourage you to review these requirements on page 28 to 30 of the application guide. This is a very important section for RUS to evaluate your equipment. I do recommend that you replicate your budget descriptions in this section created by creating a table and I did it in under each line item of equipment listed you need to fully describe how that equipment's being used how it fits within the project and how the use meets the 50 percent or greater tabs H through L are a little bit more simplistic but they are very important to a complete application Tab H is, you know, your compliance with other federal statutes, which are basically 
certifications. I think there are 10 certifications listed under tab H. Again, tab H, I, and J, which are all signed documentation, must be signed by an authorized representative of your organization. Tab I is the env environmental impact, historical preservation. It is a document that you will just complete answers on and you'll assign. Tab J is called the Schedule J and it's just evidence of legal authority. Now this tab will, as I said, contains the Schedule J. All these documents are found under the appendix of the application guide and Tab J will list your SAMS cage code. We will discuss registration in the next few slides coming up but it is very important that you make sure your registrations regarding DUNS and, and SAMS are up to date and are current. Tab K, as discussed a little bit, is your consultation with the USDA State Director. Under this tab you will provide, you will get a letter from your USDA State Director regarding uh, their comments on your project based on your project description provided to them. I do encourage you to start this early because uh, currently uh, most state offices have acting state directors who are performing more than one duty. They need time to evaluate your project description, they need time to complete their response, and you need time to get that response back to put into your application. Tab L is supplemental information. This tab is provided for you to provide additional documentation to support your project or your application and it could contain anything above what's requested in the, the previous tabs to help us better understand why you need this the federal assistance. I do not recommend that you put support letters that uh, should be under other tabs uh, within tab L. Uh, all support letters, um, support documentation should be within the respective tab for scoring so that way our US individuals who are looking at information will have the information within that tab and do not need, need or have to look through your application to try to find that support. So let's look at an, the worksheets at this time. So this is a list of worksheets that are available to you through the RUS website for, for distance learning telemedicine and are also hard copied within the application guide. Note that the site worksheet, the reality worksheet, and the economic need worksheet were discussed previously and should be consistent regarding site locations, names, and designations. The leveraging worksheet is where you will have information regarding donors as discussed and then the additional NSLP worksheet is where you would request those point, 10 points if you did not meet the 50 percent under the economic need worksheet and then we have the budget worksheet. Since we discussed the reality economic need leveraging and additional NS, oh, well, and leveraging excuse me previously we will just cover site worksheet the additional NSLP in the budget at this time. So the site worksheet. As you see here, it's similar to the reality worksheet and economic need worksheet. And what we want to keep consistent is the site number, the site name, and the site designation. Now, if you use, uh, again, these worksheets are available through the website. Uh, they are in Excel format. If you use that uh, spreadsheet, once you start filling in the site worksheet, you will see that the, the other tabbed worksheets are fillable and will actually pull the information from the site worksheet into the other worksheets. Uh, you can format uh, individual columns regarding, you know, if you're looking at uh, mon money or decimal places, uh, things like that, you can format those items and also I, I do recommend that you format the cells to be a wrap text so that way if your not, site name is longer than the cell provided uh, it will be represented 
clearly uh, with the cell, uh, you know, increasing to fit the information you're putting in. So please uh, do that and make sure you, you do format for wrap text. Using the uh, site number consecutively is very important for us because this does uh, help us to evaluate your application quickly. Um, and we know that each site, if it's the same uh, as we're going through, we'll, we'll be able to identify each site uh, appropriately. So let's look at the next worksheet, which is the budget worksheet. The budget worksheet, as discussed before, uh, it should be consistent with your telecommunications system plan. Okay, And what I mean by that is when we're looking at the line number and we're looking at the site name and description, which are the first three columns on the left, that information should be presented the same in your telecommunications system plan under your tab G. So that therefore you can uh, demonstrate each piece of equipment you're asking for us to evaluate is actually meeting the use of 50% or more. And we also can understand that the equipment is appropriate for your project. There are good examples of the budget worksheet on pages 25 and 26 of the application guide. You will find an example for the cash match budget worksheet and you will find an example of the in-kind match budget worksheet. These examples, as you see on the right of this worksheet, uh, will show you how you will put the dollar values in those columns and when you should use those columns. It's pretty straightforward, so as you could guess, the in-kind match, if you're doing an in-kind contribution, would all be represented in column on the far right. We ask you to, if you're doing in-kind match, it must be that full piece of equipment. So please don't uh, split. Uh, for, for example, if you're proposing a switch and the switch value was $50, thousand dollars don't propose an in-kind match of twenty five thousand dollars because in-kind means you're donating that equipment to the project and by splitting that means that you're purchasing half with grant and then half with in-kind and you can't do that so it has to be the full equipment listed if you're doing in-kind a lot of people confuse this uh, thinking that uh, well I'm going to be purchasing equipment as soon as I submit the application. I need to put that as in-kind match. And that's not true. If you're buying equipment uh, once you submit the application, after you submit the application, uh, that's perfectly fine for a cash match. Because the way cash match works is you as the applicant, once you purchase that piece of equipment or a, num a number of pieces of equipment, you'll provide RUS that invoice. And as given it an example for matching earlier, let's say that your project was a 100% match. That means dollar for dollar, you're putting in for the dollar you're requesting from federal. So when you provide us, let's say, a $100,000 invoice, RUS will reimburse that invoice for $50,000. You're providing $50,000 in cash match, we're providing $50,000 in grant funds. So it's not considered in-kind just because you may have purchased it prior to getting the award. It can also be, it, I mean, it can be considered cash match. And quite honestly, cash match is easier on us and you as the applicant. Because when you do in-kind, you are reliable, liable for that equipment as purchased and that full amount listed uh, as you purchase that equipment. So if your budget actually decreases once you receive an award, if you're successful, uh, you're still stuck with that amount of that equipment you stated for in-kind match. Whereas if, the, if your budget decreased because of cost savings uh, in uh, purchases of equipment, you're going to only be liable for that percentage of match on the total budget at the end of your project.
And one other, one other item, I know I switched the slide, but one other, one other item I want to uh, state right now regarding budget worksheet. RUS does ask that uh, applicants do not combine items on, on a single line item. You should represent uh, individual equipments individually. Look at those examples as I stated in the application guide. You'll see how they're broken out. RUS needs to evaluate the purchases uh, individually on an individual basis. Please do not incorporate warranties uh, and do packages uh, unless it is you know, verifiable as like a package type deal that you're buying. It is okay if you want to combine a line item just for like cables or installation uh, or shipping, uh, for instance. Uh, but please don't put multiple larger purchases within a single line item. Again, if you have questions on this, you can contact us uh, at, at the information that we will provide at the end of this uh, presentation. So now we want to discuss the registration requirements. This goes back to tab J, the, the schedule J we discussed. Uh, you are required to provide a Duns and Bradstreet number. And you also, you are required to be registered with the System for Award Management Registration, or the SAM system. This is uh, at www.sam.gov. This is a free registration. If, for instance, you are looking this up and they, uh, you find a place that wants to charge you for your SAM registration, please uh, check your website address. Uh, go to sam.gov. It is free. You should not pay for this. We do encourage you uh, before you get, you know, don't wait too long uh, before submission of your application deadline uh, to verify this information because it can take up to 10 business days to receive what we call a cage code through the SAM uh, registration. So please do this now. Uh, and don't wait to the last minute because if you don't if you are not verified within the system once we receive your application uh, we cannot uh, evaluate your application also I want to comment here whoever the applicant is for the distance learning telemedicine program that must be the corresponding DUNS number and SAM cage code you cannot as an applicant use like a parent or an affiliate organization's codes um, you know for your application it must be the code that is uh, registered for you as uh, the applicant real quick we just want to highlight that all applicants uh, are required to follow the 2 CFR 200 regulation there are this is a, kind of an accounting procurement reg regulation and there are certain requirements for procurement under this. Please evaluate this, reg uh, this requirement. Um, if your organization cannot comply with this, uh, you may want to reconsider applying for this program. Application submission. There are two ways that we, we give you um, as options for submitting your application. Please don't submit an application through grants.gov and also submit a paper application. Uh, do one or the other. Uh, if you, again, you know, we mentioned earlier regarding the tabs. If you do submit electronically, please make sure you have cover pages for your tabs. If you're going to submit a paper copy, we do ask that you provide two paper copies of a completed application. This means that all documents signatures and so forth must be within the application. Uh, we cannot accept uh, additional information that's not submitted once the application deadline expires. I d we do also ask that uh, with a net paper application that you provide uh, electronic format or a version on a CD-ROM or a USB flash drive. Please make sure that uh, the application is the same Sometimes there may be last minute changes and we want to make sure that uh, we capture your full complete application on both uh, pieces of media. Also, a little recommendation regarding uh, hand delivered or paper copies. RUS isn't liable 
uh, for the shape that will receive your application. So make sure you bind your application appropriately. Uh, we do recommend you use a courier service uh, that is trackable, such as UPS or FedEx or DHL. Uh, because if you ship it through uh, the U.S. Uh, Postal Service, it goes to a main warehouse. Uh, it could There could be delays in receiving your application that way. We normally try to allow that uh, for paper submissions. Uh, but again, you know, we do recommend you use a courier service. Uh, and also, you know, we want to make sure we get the complete application. So if we just get a bunch of papers in a box, um, it may be hard for us to, to put it back together the way you... Uh, did submit it so do your work to help us do our work better paper applications sh should be submitted to this address uh, it will the deputy assistant administrator uh, is who you will uh, title that to uh, you don't necessarily you know Sean Arner is the uh, DAA at the time although we do have an acting DAA uh, but you don't have to worry about that name. You just need to put Deputy Assistant Administrator, um, Loan Origination Approval Division, and the address. Please make sure you do put the stop and room number appropriately because if you do leave that information off, it may not re uh, be received at the appropriate place. This is the link to the website, uh, the Distance Learning Telemedicine website. When you go to that website, there will be two tabs at the top. One says Program 101, the other says Forms and Resources. Under the Forms and Resources tab, you will find the electronic format of the worksheets. You will find the application guide. Uh, you will also find previous year awards if you want to look at that and see uh, you know, organizations that's received this previously. Uh, I have had questions in the past where people's like, well, can we get previous applications? Um, you know, we are the federal government, so if, you know, to, to receive something like that from us, you have to file what we call Freedom of Information Act. I uh, don't recommend uh, going that route uh, for anyone because your project or your, your purpose that you're searching, you know, you're trying to meet in your application is, is yours. It's, it's not, uh, every situation is different. Uh, so, uh, you know, we do encourage you not to try to, you know, ask for previous applications because we just cannot just give them out to you. Uh, but certainly if you wanted to reach out, if this is your first time, you wanted to reach out to some of the previous awards uh, and talk with them, what they provide you is between you and them. Uh, so at this time... We're, we will have some questions. Uh, what we are going to do, well, before we get to that, if you have questions, there's three sources. We don't list the third, but first you can email what we call the DLT uh, email, um, pay, uh, the email service. This is a centralized email that people over this program look at. Uh, and by emailing the DLT info at wdc.usda.gov uh, helps us keep track of the questions being requested and allows us to make FAQs uh, and also provide consistent information back to applicants. Or you can call our office at 202-720-0800. The third way is contact your local GFR. A GFR is a general field representative. Uh, we have uh, GFRs throughout the, the nation that cover every state. Uh, you can look them up also on the website through the contact link uh, and, and contact them um, if necessary. But what we are going to do at this time is we are going to go over some previously requested or asked questions, provide the answers for those, uh, to give you an idea of what some uh, people, you know, uh, needed clarification on to try to better assist you uh, any way possible. So uh, as we complete that, again, we want to thank you for uh, viewing uh, this webinar. We hope it's been an assistance to you. Uh, we congratulate your effort uh, of applying for federal funding through this program to assist communities 
and to help rural America. Well, as stated on a previous slide, uh, we're going to do some FAQ questions. Thank you for being with us this long. And uh, hopefully by providing these questions and answers to you, it may uh, assist you with understanding the program requirements. So question number one, someone asked, are maintenance agreements eligible? And the answer is maintenance or service agreements for newly purchased equipment are eligible for the three-year period of the grant. RUS will allow that for the three-year period. Question number two, are warranties or extended warranties eligible? Yes, warranties or extended warranties for newly purchased equipment up to the three-year period of the grant are eligible. For example, if you purchased a piece of equipment that, that was standard with a one-year warranty and the vendor offered a two-year warranty for a price, you should list that two-year warranty separate on your budget line item. You should list the price for that and it would be eligible for RUS. Now, if you're purchasing something that goes beyond the three years, RUS would try to calculate out uh, anything over the three years and reduce that from your budget. Question number three. If a project lists hub or end user sites where no equipment is installed, do we count those for reality and NSLP? And the answer is no. RUS does not count user sites such as end user sites or hub end user sites that are not receiving equipment for the purposes of uh, the reality or NSLP calculation. This is the same for pure hubs. Pure hubs are not counted in the score. However, RUS asks that uh, you list the pure hub sites. So you should not list hub in, you know, you should not list uh, hub in user sites or user sites that are not receiving equipment um, on especially the reality score well, in the NSLP and then calculate those because that could adversely affect your project and RUS if those if those sites are listed and calculated and they're not receiving any equipment from the budget worksheet RUS will, will remove those which could reduce your your scoring for reality or NSLP question number four if any in-kind match item specifically from a vendor, is contingent on the purchase of a specific piece of equipment, is it eligible? So the question is, if, I'm buy, if a vendor is willing to provide an in-kind match of an item only if I buy other specific items from that vendor, would that be eligible? And the answer is no, because grantees are not obligated to buy from a specific vendor. Therefore, if an in-kind item is contingent on the purchase of a specific piece of equipment, that, might, that match item should be eliminated. And RUS may remove that from your budget worksheet as well as your leveraging scoring worksheet because you may choose a different vendor and there's no guarantee that that match uh, is going to be confirmed. Question number five. Are support contracts such as phone support eligible the answer is yes support contracts would be considered technical assistance and would be eligible up to 10 percent of the grant amount or match amount or 10 percent of the eligible matching funds calculated separately question six what is considered technical assistance in eligible grant purposes category three well, technical assistance is defined in 7 CFR 1703.102, which is the regulation covering DLT, as the following. Technical assistance means, one, assistance in learning to manage, operate, or use equipment or systems, and two, studies, analyzes, designs, reports, manuals, guides, literature, or other forms of creating, acquiring, or disseminating information. Assistance in learning to manage this system would be considered training. Studies and analysis 
designs, etc. would be considered training materials. Combined, they may not exceed 10% of the grant amount or match amount or 10% of the eligible matching funds calculated separately. Question number seven. Are cloud services eligible in the DLT program? Yes, cloud services are eligible if the applicant can demonstrate that the access to the cloud used predominantly for DLT use, this can be supported in the telecommunications systems plan. This, uh, and a good example of this is uh, with a lot of telemedicine type projects where the in-touch robot uh, is um, being purchased. As you know, the in-touch provides what they call sure connect as a way of communication and that is a annual uh, fee and that's what we consider as like a cloud service question eight what is meant by communication upgrades between ambulances emergency transportation vehicles and medical facilities as discussed earlier early on in the presentation uh, this is a communications upgrade, which you know should have a I'm sorry, a telemedicine component, where the ambulance or medical transport attendant and patient could communicate with a medical professional at a hospital or a medical clinic. The applicant must demonstrate that the primary purpose of the equipment upgrades are for DLT purposes. Question nine. Can we accept equipment in kind match that was purchased prior to application submittal? And the answer is yes, if the equipment is new and undepreciated and not installed. And question 10. Can equipment to be paid with grant funds be purchased prior to application submittal? And the answer is no. Section 5.2 of the grant agreement states the grant shall not be expended to cover any costs incurred in the connection with the project prior to the date of receipt by RUS of the application. So 9 and 10 are really good to understand based on what you, you know, in kind, which could be equipment purchased prior to the application submittal, would be allowable if it was not installed as well but if it's a match contribution then that would need to be a post application type expense so that is 10 questions we felt maybe this would help you out thank you again for participating in this webinar uh, we hope that it benefits you good luck in your application process if you do need us Please contact us again at dltinfo at wdc.usda.gov or contact us by phone 202-720-0800. Thank you again and have a great day.